Well, C.S. Lewis once said that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You see, the way that God speaks to us in our suffering is unlike anything else in this world if we listen. You know, the past few years have been some of the hardest for most of our lives uh, throughout this pandemic. Through COVID, racial tensions and injustice, hurricanes, political unrest, so much pain, so much death, so much suffering. Is there anything we can gain from all that we have endured over these years? I believe so. You see, suffering can become a school for those who trust in the sovereignty of Jesus. Some of life's most important lessons can be learned during difficult seasons. And so I want to take us into that school today and learn some important lessons to feed our faith. First of all, uh, one lesson that we probably already know is that suffering is connected to pain. This is an obvious one. Uh, Suffering is painful. We normally don't like it. Uh, But the pain of suffering is part of the consequence of sin that has entered our world. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the consequence of that was pain entering the world in childbirth, in the workplace, in creation. Romans 8.22 reminds us that for we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. All of creation is groaning as if it is in a constant state of pain and longing. And we see how deep the curse of sin has impacted all of creation. Biology, cells, viruses, disease, and ultimately death. Creation is groaning and longing for the return and the restoration of all things when Christ comes. And then verse 23 says, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. So we too groan, we too suffer, we too long to be free from this cracked and broken world, but that will only happen when Christ returns. We'll be adopted and our bodies will be made new. And then verse 24 says, For this, in this we hope, and we are saved. We hope that is seen. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For what, who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So the only way we can get through pain is through the gift of hope that God gives to us. I have learned the power of hope in the midst of pain in a very difficult way. You know, when I was in undergrad, uh, it was my sophomore year, and it was, I specifically remember, it was Mother's Day. And so each Sunday I would call my parents and I called my mom to wish her a happy Mother's Day. And then we finished our semester of small groups. And so my co-leader and I, we decided, hey, you know what? After I make this call, let's go out for a nice dinner. Uh, just celebrate the semester, and so I borrow my friend's scooter. And so we're uh, driving, and I may have been going a little bit fast because there was a police officer behind me. And so I pull over, but the thing, the place that I was pulling over with had a lot of construction for a new building, and there's a lot of rubble. And so as I was uh, pressing the brakes, suddenly, um, because of all the rubble, the scooter completely flipped over. And so all of that weight and the weight of my co-leader a co-leader in my, my way landed on my left knee. And so we bounced off my left knee and I flipped over and I was on my back. And, uh, and all of a sudden my co-leader, she gets up, she dusts off and she looks at me and goes, is that your bone? And then I look at my knee and my bone was revealed. I was like, oh, and somehow it hurt more after that, you know? And I was like, ow! And the police officer comes and, you know, in his compassion he says, can I see your license? And I go, my knee. He goes, don't worry, I call the ambulance. Can I see your license? (laughs) And so I give it to him. And then we get to the emergency, and I kid you not, it's like I've never seen, you know, my bone open up like that before. And so the doctor comes in, and really somber. He goes, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to amputate your leg. And I pop out of my bed. I go, what? He goes, just kidding. (laughs) I I was like, what? 
kind of unprofessional <laughs> doctor are you? But obviously I couldn't say that because I didn't want to upset him because he's about to do something to my knee. And so he's like, don't worry about it. We'll uh, clean it up, stitch you up. You'll be out of here in no time. And so he puts in some local anesthetic and then he starts to clean and cut and put away all the gravel that was inside. And I'm like, oh, he goes, you could feel that? I was like, yeah. Okay, let me put some more local anesthetic. So he puts another shot in. And then he starts to clean and cut. And I'm like, oh, he's like, you could still feel that? I'm like, yes. Okay, this is the most I could put out. I'll put one, of my sh- one more shot, but after that, I can't do anything else. So I'm like, please let this work. He puts in the local anesthetic. And then I'm like, oh, you could feel that? I'm like, yes. I'm sorry, you're going to have to just endure. And then I kid you not, he had to cut and scrape and stitch, and I had to feel everything. I've, and the only thing, the only thing that allowed me to endure it was to literally think one day, one year from now, this will be over. Like I literally had to put my hope in the future because anything else, if I focused on the pain of the present, I was going to go crazy. But that's when I did experience a taste of the power of hope that gets us through the pain of today by the promise of what is to come tomorrow. And you see, we will be continually connected to pain in this lifetime because we live in a broken and fallen world, a sin-cursed world. But as believers, we are connected to pain in this world because we follow the suffering servant. So the path that he calls us to follow him on is the path of the cross. And this path includes crucifixion, but also a lot of pain along the way. So as long as we live in the sin-cursed world, we will continue to face suffering and pain. So what do we do? Do we just complain about it? Do we sulk? How are we as believers to view the pain that comes into our lives? And so we need to learn a couple of other things in this school of suffering. Again, we all know that suffering is connected to pain, But another lesson that is important for us to feed our faith with is that suffering is also connected to a process for the believer. Look at James chapter 1 verse 2 and following. It says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials in various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So James says, count it all joy. Count it a joyous occasion when you suffer in all different kinds of ways. Weird guy, right? Strange guy. He's either out of his mind or he's able to see something that's out of this world and into another world. James can say this because he's able to see a purpose of suffering that many people do not see. He says in verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So all of suffering is connected to a process of revealing or testing true faith. You see, suffering reveals but also refines true faith. Trials are a test to show where your faith and where your treasure really rests in. Is it strong enough to handle storms or is it soft and not ready to handle the winds of this harsh world? In essence, it is showing us how much we truly trust God or treasure him. How deep are your foundations? Are you grounded in God where the foundation of your life is rooted in Christ and his word. You see, sometimes God will bring struggles into our lives to show us that our faith may not be as strong as we think it is. You know, um, also when I was in Australia, there was one time I led a short-term mission team to Thailand. 
And you know, during the prep process and also while we were doing our mission trip in Thailand, I had, you know, I had the team do like morning exercises to get the blood flowing. We would memorize verses throughout the day to keep the word in them. And a motivating factor to get them to memorize the word was, you know, if you messed up or you couldn't memorize the verse for the day, you would have to do some push-ups and you know, just various things like that. And so it was a very long day of ministry. And uh, the day before we left for back home, return after two weeks uh, in Thailand, one of the sisters on the team, she started complaining of chest problems. And she was really concerned. She's like, Eddie, uh, can we go to the hospital? My chest feels very different right now. I'm not comfortable right now. So obviously, yeah, we rushed her to the R. And they did all these tests. And um, then she started to freak out. She's like, Eddie, I know the team's got to go back. But if I have to stay here in the hospital, can you or somebody on the team stay with me? She was really starting to get concerned. I was like, of course. Yeah, somebody's going to be, don't don't worry about it. Just, you know, just relax. And, And so after several hours of intense testing and interviewing her and stuff, the doctor revealed she could take her home because she's suffering from sore muscles. I was like, excuse me? So after all this, it turns out that she had never exercised in her life before. And so the exercises and the push-ups that we had to do during the mission trip caused the sensations of pain in her muscles that she never knew existed before. You know, our faith is like a spiritual muscle. And like physical muscles, it's usually in the gym, through MMA, jiu-jitsu, whatever you do, right? Lifting heavy objects or doing push-ups for the first time. That's what impacts our muscles. These opportunities of resistance reveals how strong we really are. If your muscles were never tested, they would never get stronger. And that also is a reflection of faith. It shows our true colors. But suffering is also a process that refines our faith. It not only reveals our faith, mixed with faith in Christ, it refines our faith. Verse 3 and 4 of James says, So you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So there is something that happens in us, in our faith, during trials, that produces something stronger in us. Romans 5.3 also says, not only that, but we rejoice in suffering, same thing that James just told us, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So when we are in the fire of affliction, we combine that with hope in God, faith in God, then God forms character, maturity, faithfulness, growth, and gold in you. And there's another process that is involved in our suffering. If we look at 1 Peter 4.12, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice, again, Echoing now, Peter, James, Paul, they're all echoing the same message here. But rejoice in the suffering insofar as you realize that you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So suffering allows us to share in the sufferings of Christ. You see, suffering is a process of walking with Christ in order to become like Christ, drawing us closer to Christ. It is a process of making us more like Jesus in our faith, in our hope, in our love, in our character. You see, a primary aim of suffering is to draw you to Christ in the place of desperation, dependence, and prayer. What does James say later on in chapter 5, verse 13? Is anyone among you suffering? Let them pray. That's one of the aims of suffering, to draw you closer to Christ. What are we to do when life hurts? Pray, enter his presence, draw near to him, vent to him, cry out to him, complain to him. Our class is hard. Is home hard? Our relationships hard? Complain to God. 
first. We're good at complaining to each other. We're good at venting online. But as believers, we need to learn to give all of that to God first. Amen? And most importantly, suffering is a process of teaching us and giving us opportunities to magnify Christ as most supreme in our lives. A key lesson we learn is that seasons of suffering are a gift of grace. How so? It is a gift to be able to flex and strengthen our muscles of magnifying Christ as more precious, more supreme than anything else in our lives. It is an opportunity to show him how much we trust and treasure him. You know, when I was in uh, South Korea, one of the ministries we did was to care for North Korean refugees. And it's it's a pretty huge uh, population actually in South Korea. And, uh, but there is one story that we heard of a mother who tried to cross uh, into China. She got found out, uh, but the mother and her five-year-old son got caught and sent back to North Korea. And when you get caught, for trying to escape, that's pretty much a death sentence. And so the guards started to kick and beat the son, the five-year-old son, and the mother just covered her son and took the beatings instead. And so she started to get kicked and kicked and kicked until she passed away. Now, as she was shielding, nobody wants to get kicked. Nobody chooses that kind of suffering. But what was she doing? She was in embracing that suffering, she was really loving her son. And in that moment, she was revealing that my love for my son is far greater than even my love for my life. It was an opportunity that expressed deep love for the one that she loved. And that is what suffering does. It gives us an opportunity to tell the world that most of all, to tell Jesus, that Jesus, I love you more. That I love you more than loss, than this pandemic, than my comfort. Jesus, in this hard season, I'm gonna choose to trust you, to treasure you, and to declare in my heart, I'm gonna love you more than what this world is offering to me. Now there's one more key lesson on suffering that I wanna share with you today. That again, we all know suffering is connected to pain, uh, but also in faith we realize it's connected to a process. But there's a third thing that Peter, Paul, James keep echoing in their verses on suffering And that is that suffering is connected to a present, a gift. Gifts in this life, but also gifts in the life to come. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life for which God has promised to those who love him. So there are blessings that await those who remain faithful under trial. For when he has passed the test, he or she will receive the crown of life. So those who pass the test will receive a glorious presence, crown of life, an eternal reward. But what does it mean to pass the test when we suffer? James reveals it at the end of verse 12. He says, to those who love him. So to pass the test during trials means loving Jesus through the trial. You love him, though you suffer loss. You love him, though you suffer betrayal. Revelation 2.10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So holding on to Jesus through the trials, through these tests of trials, we'll be rewarded on judgment day and for all of eternity. So these are some of the presents that are promised to his people who go through pain. But gifts are not only connected to the suffering for the afterlife, they're also connected to the here and now. How so? One of the greatest gifts or presents that suffering gives to us is to peel our fingers off from holding on to this world as if this is our final destination. 
and instead to hope in Christ and our eternal home. When I lost my daughter 13 years ago at just 95 days, uh, that was the hardest season of navigating the valleys of the shadow of death. And her 13th birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks. So October always has that memory for me. And it reminded me again because just last week, a friend of mine in Houston, they were expecting their third child. And there were no complications in pregnancy, but literally after he gave birth, their baby stopped breathing. And they just buried him yesterday. So when I hear stories like that, when I hear reminders that this world is fallen and broken, I remember that season of how it allowed me to have a deep longing for the return of Christ. A deep longing to see this fallen world finally redeemed. You see, suffering gives us the gift of proper perspective in this world. To see the world as it really is, fallen, broken, hurting, temporary, a place of sorrows, a place of grief, a place of goodbyes. Suffering shows us that this world is not worth living for. It gives us the gift of proper eyesight to see heaven as our true home, that this kingdom is eternal, that this kingdom of God is what will last forever, that this kingdom of God is what matters most now, that this kingdom of God is worth living for now and forever. You see, anything that keeps our eyes on eternity is a gift. Anything that will lessen our love for this fallen world and increase our longing for Christ, our love for Christ, our longing for his return, that is a gift into our lives. Amen. And that is a gift to our faith. You see, God will allow Satan to work in our lives to do just enough to accomplish the opposite of what the enemy was ultimately trying to do. You see, Satan's aim in suffering is for you to detach from God and to weaken your faith in him. But God will allow Satan to bring suffering into our lives so that we will detach from this world and hold on to him. James Noble Mackenzie was a Scottish-Australian missionary uh, to a unreached tribal people group in the South Pacific, and that area is now known as Vanuatu. And he was doing missionary work in the late 1800s. His time there as a pioneer missionary was hard. Uh, Living in a jungle, rural area, seeking to translate the Bible into a new language, and contracting both he and his wife a lot of rare diseases. In the 15 years he was serving there, his wife died because of sickness, and soon afterwards he contracted a very serious sickness and had to leave. He went through years of suffering, years of sickness, and years of loss as a missionary in that island. After recovering in Australia, he really wanted to go back to Vanuatu, but his mission board would not let him stating health was an issue, that he would not last if he kept contracting these types of diseases. Instead, they sent him to South Korea in 1910. And he was disappointed at first, but he obeyed. Upon arrival, he began serving the leper colonies in the southern parts of Korea. He also shared the gospel, he demonstrated the gospel, he planted churches, and one of the people he shared the gospel with was my great-great-great-grandfather. And then he took his son, my great-great-grandfather, under his wing, and they began ministering together and setting up churches together in South Korea. And you see, it was through his ministry, one of the first missionaries in Korea, that my family received the gospel more than 100 years ago. But also, it was because of his suffering and sickness that God redirected his life from Vanuatu to South Korea, to our family, to me. He didn't want to leave the island at first, but God used that suffering to guide him. And it was because of his sickness and suffering that salvation 
ultimately came to my family five generations later. So I stand before you today as a believer, but also as one preaching the word of God to you because of the sufferings of James Noel Mackenzie. So I thank God for the life, the ministry, but also, also I thank God for the suffering of James Mackenzie. You see, God uses our pain, our sickness, our suffering, our loss in ways that we could never imagine to serve his purposes in a mysterious but majestic way under his sweet sovereignty in a way that will bring him glory in the end. Therefore, my brothers and sisters of Talbot, of Biola, no matter the seasons of hardships that come your way, trust him, hold on to him, put your hope in him. That is one of the greatest gifts you could do to feed your faith during the fires of affliction. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.